Bruchim Abohim. Uh, the topic today will be a continuation of what we began last week. Uh, we talked about stories. So once we've done that, there's a story that I wrote. I, again, I'm the Shul storyteller. And uh, God inspired me and I wrote this story called The Tale of Two Porters. And uh, we'll take two, probably three weeks, and I'd like to tell the story. hope you find it interesting, and I hope you find it educational and inspirational. So let's begin. A tale of two porters. Boris worked as a porter, and he was on his way to the train station, as usual, and he was late. But he hoped that he would still be able to find some passengers or businessmen who needed some help with his or her luggage or merchandise. He was often late, but somehow he still managed to squeeze out a living to support himself and his three young children. Ruble here, ruble there. And if he was on time, which didn't happen often, he might even get a tip. Today, he was fortunate enough to find a businessman who wanted a package delivered to one of his wealthy customers by three in the afternoon. Boris took the package. When he looked at the address, he realized that really, he really wasn't in such a hurry. The resident wasn't far away, and he had plenty of time to make his delivery on time. He was confident he would even get, earn a nice tip. The day was hot and the package was heavy. And so when Boris, Boris saw a large oak tree with its leafy branches inviting him to escape the heat and sit under its shady leaves, he decided to take a break and rest just for a minute. He rested his back against the tree's large trunk and his mind started to wander. And he thought to himself, as he often did, why did God treat him so badly? After all, he was a good Jew. He prayed three times a day, kept Shabbos, ate kosher, kept all the holidays, and on occasion would even learn some Torah. He saw how comfortably the rich customers whose packages he would deliver lived. Large, beautiful homes with all the finest luxuries. And he lived in a small two-room hut with his wife and three children thought to himself, were they that much more righteous than he, that they deserved so much and he deserved so little? He was bitter and questioned God in his fairness. Why did he have to work so hard and yet earn so little? Why couldn't he be rich? He looked up and he was stunned because standing before him was someone who looked like an angel. <laughs> Not that he'd actually seen an angel before, but there was something angelic about the man who stood in front of him. The man spoke, and sure enough, it was an angel. The angel told Boris that God had heard his complaints and had decided that he would give Boris three separate chances to acquire fabulous wealth. The first test would be in the desert. If he didn't pass that test, the next would be on a mountain. And if he failed that test, a third and final test would occur in a forest. The angel then handed him a manual and he said, God wants you to earn your reward. And so he has told me to give you this book. In it is everything you need to know about your tests. Make sure to study and learn all the information. It will help you to succeed in your quest. The angel then told him that the first test would begin at 6 a.m. the next morning and that he would have 12 hours to complete the test. In the meantime, the angel said that God had commanded him to take Boris to a luxuri luxurious inn to spend the night and to prepare for his test. The angel took him to the inn and introduced him to the innkeeper, who was very friendly and kind. He wished Boris well, and he personally showed him to his room. When Boris walked into the room, he was pleasantly surprised. It wasn't a room. It was a suite. There was a king-size bed with fine linen and goose-down pillows an overstuffed comforter, and then there were two comfortable chairs in front of a fire burning brightly in the fireplace. On the table next to the chairs were fine pastries and fruits, even a bottle of wine. He couldn't believe his eyes. The innkeeper told him that there was a change of clothing in the closet for him to wear, and even designer shoes. He said that dinner would be served in the dining room in one hour. The innkeeper told Boris to relax, if he wanted, he could even take a nap. <laughs> but how could he take a nap? He was too excited by everything that was happening to close his eyes. 
At six, he went down to the dining room, dressed in his new clothing. He felt like a new person, a better person. The dining room was very beautiful, filled with people and laughter. The innkeeper himself escorted him to a private table where he would be served his meal. The waiter gave him a menu and a wine list to choose from. But the truth is he really didn't recognize any of the selections that were offered. He looked up at the waiter with a look of confusion. And the waiter instantly understood and said, with a smile, excellent choices. The waiter brought him one course after another, one more delectable than the one before it. Ah, and then there was the wine with names again he couldn't pronounce, but one finer than the next. As he was eating his meal, <clears throat> people came over to his table, friendly people, attractive people, successful looking people, who had heard about his good fortune, and each one wanted to share a lachaim, a drink, with him and wish him success on his test in the morning. Then the band began to play beautiful music, and Boris felt like dancing to the lively beat. His head was spinning with joy and ecstasy. Ah, he was happy. His serenity was interrupted with the loud sound of banging again and again. And though he tried, he couldn't ignore it. And then he realized he was in bed. And the banging that he heard was coming from the door to his suite. He dragged himself out of the bed and somehow stumbled to open the door. Standing there was the angel. And he said to Boris, Yeah, I've been banging on your door for hours. It's already 12 noon. And you only have six more hours left to complete your test in the desert. Flustered, Boris quickly grabbed the clothes and fancy shoes that he had worn the night before and just ran out of his suite to follow the angel to the desert. He vaguely heard the angel ask him whether he had studied the manual, and whether he had brought along all the necessary equipment that he would need to accomplish his goal. His head was still spinning from the wine and liquor that he had drunk the night before. He barely heard what the angel said. Next thing he knew, he was standing at the edge of a desert, and the angel was explaining to him what his mission would be. The angel said, can you see that sand dune in the distance? Boris nodded yes. The angel continued, If you can reach the other side of that sand dune by 6 p.m., you will receive your reward of great wealth. Boris looked at the sand dune, and it really didn't look that far away. He was happy. This seemed very doable. The angel asked him about a compass and a watch and mentioned heading in a southerly direction. But he never read the manual and had no idea what the angel was talking about. All he knew was that the sand dunes seemed close and the time was late and he wanted his reward. And so he began to walk. You know, at first the ground seemed relatively firm and easy to walk on. But as he continued to walk, the sand became looser and it seemed like he was walking through cement. And he realized that his designer shoes were not made to walk in desert sand. And in addition, the sun was beating down on him mercilessly. And the fancy suit from the night before gave him little comfort or protection from its intense heat. He had no hat, no sunglasses, no sunscreen, not even a drop of water. His skin was burning up in the afternoon sun and his body was starting to blister all over. He was thirsty and his throat was parched. And then the wind began to blow, and he was swallowing mouthfuls of sand. And it was blowing so hard that he couldn't keep it out of his eyes. He couldn't see. The sand was beating on his blisters like little daggers, cutting into his flesh. He was bleeding all over. He was blistered, bleeding, dehydrated, almost blind, and totally exhausted. The sand dune that seemed so close before now seemed to be moving further and further away with each torturous step that he took. He turned to the angel and said, I can't go on. If I go on any further, I'll die. I give up. And the angel looked at him with a weak but encouraging smile, and he said, don't worry, I'm sure you'll do better tomorrow at the mountain. The angel took Boris back to the inn. <laughs> he was barely able to walk. 
The angel said goodbye and told him he would back to pick, be back to pick him up at 6 a.m. the next morning to begin his next test on the mountain. He warned Boris to make sure that he studied the manual so that he would be prepared. <laughs> prepared for what? Boris wondered how he would be able to climb a mountain. He was barely able to walk. And that's when he saw the innkeeper. Boris could see by the innkeeper's reaction just how awful he really looked. But the innkeeper quickly took on a positive smile and he said to Boris, This inn is a health spa. And we have curative baths that can miraculously cure all types of aches, pains, and bruises. Just soaking in a bath for one hour will cure you of all your ailments and make you better than new. And one hour later, just as the innkeeper had predicted, Boris was totally healed and totally confident again about his ability to pass his test on the mountain. He went to his room and opened the manual and began to scan the information that would help him to be able to reach the top of the mountain and receive his fabulous wealth. But before he could get too deeply involved in the manual, there was a knock at the door. And the innkeeper was telling him that dinner was about to be served and that he would find new clothing and shoes in his closet to wear. Boris got dressed. The clothing was impressive. And he admired himself in the mirror on his way down to the dining room. He looked good. He felt good. I mean, he, he was in good spirits. The innkeeper escorted him to his private table, and the same waiter was there to greet him with a smile and kind words of consolation for his difficult day in the desert. But he ended with words of encouragement about his upcoming test on the mountain. The waiter didn't wait for Boris to look at the menu. He just brought him one exotic course after the other. And these somehow were even more delicious than those he had eaten the night before. Even the wine somehow tasted finer. And once again, many of the customers in the dining room came over to express their regrets at his temporary setback, but offered their best wishes and support on his future success. Of course, everyone wanted to drink to his successful challenge on the mountain. Come on, and how could he say no to their kind requests? His depression was completely gone, and he had totally forgotten the pain and disappointment that he had felt only hours ago. He was happy again. And the, began, the band began to play the same sweet music that had so moved him the night before. And he got up and began to dance as if he didn't have a care in the world. His feelings of joy and excitement were interrupted by the sounds of loud banging. He opened his eyes and realized, yeah, he was in bed again, and that someone was banging on his door. He jumped out of bed and opened the door. There was the angel looking at him in disbelief. He said, it's 12 noon again, and you're still in bed. You only have six hours left to climb the mountain. He grabbed his clothes, but this time he had read enough of the manual to know that he had to put on warm clothes and boots to climb the mountain. He looked down and he saw that there was a backpack with his name on the floor. He picked up the bag, but it felt much too heavy to carry up a mountain. And so he began to take things out. Picks, heavy ropes, locking carabiners, a harness, and anything else he didn't think seemed important. Then he picked the, back, the pack back up again with a sense of satisfaction. Now it didn't feel so heavy. He followed the angel to the mountain filled with confidence. After all, he was still relatively young and strong, and he was sure he'd be successful and pass his test today and receive his just reward. They stood at the base of the mountain, and Boris was smiling. He had expected something like Mount Everest, but the mountain looked much more like a hill. He was happy and very confident. So much so that when the angel began to give him some advice about the climb, he wasn't really paying much attention. <clears throat> the angel asked Boris whether he had studied the manual. Now, he was too embarrassed to tell him the truth, that he'd only glanced at it, and that he had really meant to study it when he returned to his room after dinner. So he told the angel that he had. The angel was trying to warn him that the beginning might seem easy, but it would get harder, colder, and steeper as he would climb up the mountain. He also warned him to use his compass and always, always travel south. Boris thanked the angel for all of his advice, and even while he was still trying to give Boris his final instructions, 
Boris was already moving forward. He knew he was late, and so he started his climb up the mountain. All he could think about was the wealth that was waiting for him at the top of the mountain. The noon sun was beating down on him, and the heavy coat, hat, and gloves were making him very hot and uncomfortable. And so he decided to take them off and to climb in his sweater. And so he removed his coat, hat, and heavy gloves and continued his climb. He felt much more comfortable in his heavy sweater. But about an hour into the climb, the weather began to change, and the air became thinner as he climbed higher and higher. The wind began to howl. The temperature began to drop rapidly. <laughs> and then the snow began to fall. He then began to regret that he had not listened to the angel. He pushed on. His fingers began to freeze, and he was shivering all over. And then as the climb began to get steeper and steeper, he lost his footing. He began to tumble back down the mountain. And now he regretted not keeping the safety ropes or harness that were in his backpack. But the thought of the great wealth kept him pushing onward. He fell again and again, and he could hear his bones as they were breaking on the rocks below. It was over. He could no longer move, no matter how much money he would receive. His body was broken, and so was his spirit. With great pain and agony, he turned to the angel and said, that not only would he not be able to continue his climb up the mountain, but he was not able to move at all. He actually thought he might die there on the mountain. The angel was sympathetic, as he had been in the desert, and told him not to give up. After all, there was still tomorrow in the forest to look forward to. Boris really didn't see how he would be able to do anything tomorrow. He couldn't walk. But the angel had two big, strong men carry him back to the inn. The innkeeper was in shock when he saw him. And Boris could see by the expression on his face just how bad he must have looked. The innkeeper quickly regained his composure. And he assured Boris that in one hour, the curative baths would not only heal his cuts and bruises, but also his broken bones. One hour later... Boris was amazed. It was miraculous. All of his cuts and bruises were healed, and not only that, his broken bones were all mended. He was happy and hopeful again. The innkeeper told him that dinner would be served at six as usual, and that in his closet he would find a new change of clothes to wear. Well, Boris didn't put on the new clothing. He didn't take a drink, and he barely spoke to anyone. He politely acknowledged their best wishes, but he ate a quick meal, and went directly to his room, opened up the manual, and began to read. He was surprised to see there really wasn't much for him to study. The manual said that he would be given a watch, a compass, and a flashlight. There would be ten sections to the test in the forest, and if he made it through the last test, he would find his reward. The instructions warned him to always travel due south, to make sure that he was at the end of each section exactly on the hour. There was a warning not to eat from any of the fruit that he might find along the way, and it also suggested that he look forward, not left, not right, or backwards. That was it. Nothing else. Seemed simple enough, and so he decided to get a good night's sleep. The next morning, at exactly 6 a.m., Boris was waiting for the angel. He was eager to begin his last and final test. He was confident that this time he was prepared and would certainly attain his much-desired goal. He would finally have all the wealth that he so often coveted. The angel knocked on his door and was pleasantly surprised to see Boris standing there with his watch, his compass, and his flashlight. They went to the forest. Boris still didn't understand exactly what the test of the forest was about. He only knew one thing, he was going to pass it. The angel once again reminded Boris about always traveling south, being on time at the end of each of the ten sections, and to always only look forward, and most of all, not to eat anything. The angel then wished him well, and the test began. The first section of the forest was simple. There was a wide path that he followed, and it led to a wall covered with ivy. He looked down at his watch, and exactly on the hour, a wide double door appeared, and he walked into what he assumed to be the second section of his test. <clears throat> he walked down another wide path for about five minutes, <clears throat> but then he remembered he had not looked at his compass. 
He was certain he was on the right path. After all, it was straight out the door from the first section. However, when he looked at his camp compass, he was surprised to see that somehow he was heading east. He quickly retraced his steps and picked up the pace. He confirmed with his compass that he was walking south. And he came to another wall covered in vines with luscious grapes. But he remembered the angel warnings. And he just waited for the hour and suddenly a door opened. Not as large as the first, but he stepped into what was the third section of his test. He looked down at his compass immediately. And just as he thought, the wide road in front of him was heading west, not south. He now understood the forest was comprised of a maze. He found a narrow, narrow path that was heading south and followed it to the next wall that was covered with delectable figs. Again, he was tempted, but he didn't eat any of the figs. He looked at his watch and it was exactly on the hour, but there was no doorway that opened up. He looked down at his compass and realized he was not standing due south, but was off by five degrees. He took a few steps to his right and a doorway appeared. He was now in his fourth section. When the door closed behind him, now he realized why he needed the flashlight. It was as if the sun had set and darkness was approaching. He checked his compass, found south, and began to walk. The path was narrower than before, but with the aid of his flashlight, he reached the fifth section. This wall was covered with large and succulent dates, but he only admired them from afar. He checked his compass, and exactly on the hour, a smaller door appeared. He stepped in, and when the door shut behind him, he was in total darkness. Using his flashlight, he found his way to the next wall, and another smaller door opened. He continued on to the next section, and the path became very narrow. <clears throat> he forgot the advice that the angel had told him. Only look forward, do not look right, left, or behind you. He turned his flashlight to the right and the left and behind, and then he froze. He then realized he was no longer on a path, but that now he was on a board about 12 inches wide. There was nothing but emptiness to his right and to his left. It looked like the path behind him was no longer there. He froze. Too paralyzed to move, he almost lost his balance. And for the first time, he called out to God to give him strength and resolve. And somehow, he moved his feet forward and regained his confidence. He just made it to the wall at the hour and a smaller door opened up. He was now at the ninth section and he had learned his lessons. He made sure to check his compass. And even though he could see the path, that the path or board was even narrower than before, he just followed the path with his flashlight, never looking anywhere but straight ahead. Finally, he was at the end of the ninth section, this next doorway would lead into the final section of his test. He was nervous and excited, so close, so close to all the wealth that he so desperately yearned for. And suddenly his thoughts were interrupted by the last door opening. The doorway was very narrow. And actually he had to squeeze sideways to get through. It was very tight. Finally, he was in the last section. He had to stop for a moment because now the light was so bright that he was blinded. He couldn't see anything. He waited with great excitement as his eyes adjusted to the light. And there, there in front of him was a glass door. And behind it was more treasure than he could ever have imagined. He was in ecstasy. But he had to wait until the hour for the door to open so that he can enter and receive his reward for completing his test. He had time. And he began to look around the tenth section. That was when he realized just how beautiful everything really was. It was breathtaking. He was sure that this must be the Garden of Eden. The exquisite flowers and trees with all kinds of luscious fruits, exotic birds, butterflies, and intoxicating smells, all that were beyond description. He began to walk towards the last door, <laughs> but in his excitement he forgot to look at his compass. He walked down the path enjoying all the beauty around him, thinking that he was moving closer and closer to the final door, but in reality, he was walking further and further away with each step. And he felt uh, with each step a greater and greater urge to reach up and taste one of the luscious fruits that were hanging low on the trees 
that filled the garden. And then as he moved further away, he saw a tree and its fruits it was the most delectable thing that he'd ever seen. He thought to himself, what could it hurt? So he reached up and took a fruit. He couldn't help himself. Somehow he wanted to taste the fruit more than anything he had ever desired in his life. He just had to take a bite. And so he did. And the feeling that he felt was beyond description. He felt sheer ecstasy. But then he began to feel tired. He was exhausted. It had been a long, tiring day, and he thought that he still had plenty of time to reach the final door. And so he sat down under a big oak tree and laid back against its large trunk, and he closed his eyes. And suddenly he heard someone calling out his name again and again. Boris! Boris, is that you? He woke up, and there he was, back at the oak tree. He looked at his watch, and not only had he lost his chance at fabulous wealth, but that the package that he was supposed to deliver was going to get there late, and he wouldn't even get his tip. Next week, we'll talk about Barrow, the second porter. Thank you very much for coming. God bless, and have a great Shabbos.